<laughs> Thank you. When, uh, when Jan said uh, some good and some bad investment decisions, of course what he really meant was that some of us make good and some of us make bad All investment decisions, right? <laughs> and we'll leave it to you guys to judge who made which ones. Um, so the panel is about, um, is it possible to make money in clean tech or can you only do that on the uh, internet and software side? Um, and I think the first question that I'd like to open up with is, uh, yeah, that question, is it possible to do that? Um, and is uh, the fact that it's, I think, no question harder to do that, driving people to do what I like to call alibi deals, like you know, a smart home platform which allows me to switch off my light from my phone, which supposedly is gonna save me energy because I do it more often, maybe not, right? Um, I would like maybe to, uh, Bruno, do you wanna start or? Yeah, sure. Well, sure, there is a possibility to do great deals in the clean tech space. We have gone through cycles, right? Like every industry has cycles. 2002 till 2007 was fantastic. Later on, it was less fantastic. We had a few challenging years to do good deals in the clean tech space. But I think there are opportunities in the clean tech space and we have seen a lot of uh, drivers coming up like the IT market, assets rollout, where you build a renewable energy power plants or, or uh, filters for uh, emission controls and, and reduction. And I think there are a lot of opportunities and we have new drive in the market to do good deals. I think the timing is very good at this point in time. So, uh, is, well, maybe you agree, Rob, or disagree, or? I, I think timing has definitely improved. Um, I, I think one of the things that happened in that initial um, phase of clean tech in the early 2000s was that a lot of people came into the space from dot-com, from some software, uh, and really the people who looked at those entrepreneurial companies were thinking about equity finance only. And when you saw people who were maybe getting involved in thin film solar and biofuels, they were equity finance technology development, but also factories and other big bits of infrastructure. And to people, a lot of them on, you know, on the West Coast, the um, insanity of using venture equity to build big, you know, tangible bits of infrastructure, C. Solyndra, C. Kior, uh, wasn't apparent. And, and now what we're, what we're seeing is, is a separation between infrastructure investors who will build the, you know, the large physical kit uh, and uh, startups as technology providers. So that's becoming clearer. And if you focus on that technology provision, um, you can have great scalability and, and great uh, financial success. Yeah. So is that what you're doing as well, Peter? Or? Um, I, I, th I think there's one more aspect that we have to add. I think in, in the clean tech is such a broad area that um, these days you see much more specialization of, uh, of investors in different areas of, uh, of clean tech because it's, it's simply too wide. It's too many different um, long-term uh, trends. It's too many different business models. It's, um, it's complicated and it's, it's maybe much more complicated than other sectors. So you have to, as an investor, also specialize in, in what you focus on and, and, and where you invest in and, and what your team is, is, is good at. So yeah. that's also a trend we, so uh, we what definitely are you, what see. are you specializing in? So we specialize now much more. And so initially we started out as a clean tech fund. Uh, we, we did everything from, from, from generating uh, uh, electricity to, to IT and to biotech. And these days we specialize much more in agro food and chemicals, materials, and uh, much more in digital than in, uh, in hardware. Hardware, although I think it's also necessary to say that um, it is possible to make returns in, in hardware. It's not sometimes there this myth that everything should be, should be software. I don't agree with it. But um, um, probably it's also, uh, like my previous speaker said, it's, it's all about timing. Um, uh, the sector was new 12 years ago. I remember that in those days we believed that we were running out of oil. And if we wouldn't uh, quickly do something, we would all be stuck on this planet without... Uh, energy. I think uh, we're not running Wouldn't out of oil. Wouldn't it be great if we would have run out of oil, right? <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not yet <laughs> running out of oil for sure, and that yet is going to take uh, going to take a time. Mm -hmm. But um, there are all kind of other needs to to transform uh, the world in the way we're doing. So I think I hear Peter say a little bit also that um, there's maybe a change in the type of deals that are being done over time. Do you guys see that as well? Is like if you look two years back and maybe today and two years forward, is there different types of deals that you see being done? Maybe, Tom? Um, I, I, maybe I want to add something to the, the first question, too. I mean, in the end, because we want to have an impact really fast and a big impact to save the world, um, you have to move some assets. You have to build assets. You have to in, uh, invest in infrastructure, which takes a lot of money and which is the game of infrastructure and, and later stage investors. But sometimes it's totally legitimate to, uh, 
just invest in that piece of AI that can be installed, let's say, in cement production fac factories, facilities, and it's just a little software, but it's a l huge leverage when you bring down the energy consumption in producing uh, cement. Um, so both is possible, and uh, for us, something has changed. We, uh, we invest early stage in technology companies, but then very quickly, actually, we try to circumvent the VC pipeline. We end up investing in infrastructure, in buildings, in real estate, technical real estate, or in uh, plants, in technical plants. <coughs> that has changed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, so it's, um, uh, one of the, there's another way of looking at it, which would be like um, maybe if in clean tech it's harder to make money, should LPs accept lower returns in, uh, in there? Or is that a very hard thing in our capitalistic system to, uh, to accept? I think it's difficult. I think going out and uh, offering LPs um, subordinate returns because you're offering some other value that isn't necessarily easy to measure, it's very dangerous. It's like you're mixing a strategic and a financial objective. Uh, and in a previous life, I worked at the Carbon Trust, where we had capital from the UK government. And because the driving force behind that capital was not to make money, it eventually got taken away, right? And, and the way that we all stay in business and keep this uh, transition going is to make money. Yeah. So I think I turn it around, I would say, let's find the technologies and the infrastructure and so on that makes money now, that's relevant and back that, it's about, it's about choosing which areas uh, when, uh, and be as good as um, other sectors, uh, and, and capture the current wave of interest in the energy transition. So you have to be competitive, and I don't think subordinate uh, returns work. Yeah. Tom, I see you. Uh... Yeah, I mean, we, uh, for some reason, Jan has put impact investor on my badge, which is partially right, but impact investing is sometimes, especially in Germany, confused with non-profit work, or low-profit work, and that's not at all what it is. Uh, impact is about having an impact, a large impact, and uh, we, we think impact investing, so having an impact on society and the planet, ecology, um, is actually necessary for achieving a sustainable financial profit. Um, if you're working against the planet or against the megatrends, you're, you have a short-lived uh, company. Um, and the other way around, too. I mean, uh, we, we think uh, investing in impact or having a, an objective helping the planet and the people is a de-risking model for us. So uh, not only that, uh, um, uh, do we have the same profit thresholds as others, but we think we, we lower the risk in investments when, we, when the company is aligning with the planet's uh, needs. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit to, I think many of the entrepreneurs in the room will, of course, also when they pick, uh, because they are in clean tech businesses, otherwise wouldn't be here, they're going to pick VCs. And one of the things that is often said is, actually, I, you know, as an investor, of course, like everyone else, you know, I was a value-add investor, right? So uh, does such a thing exist, or is, in the end of the day, doesn't matter, guys, just maximize the pre-money valuation and take that. And so, and maybe when you guys start answering it, we can answer it with specific examples. Because the answer is, of course, yes, and I am a value-add investor. <laughs> so, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if I contrast clean tech to, say, digital and, you know, the kind of the world center of VC on the West Coast, there have not been that many success stories. There's not a reliable pipeline of exits and so on. And the consequence of that is there are not many experienced uh, management people around. So if you want a, a CEO that's had two, three exits in clean tech, very few people. Um, so lots of talented people who want to get into the space, but we miss that experience. And to compensate for that, we end up being very, very hands-on uh, in our companies. And the, the example I gave earlier, I'll, I'll use again, series power. When we came in and, and, and did a rescue round of the company, we were inside the company doing the turnarounds, writing a new strategy, um, picking in a, a new management team, and then leading the fundraise process for the next three rounds. So it wasn't just turning up to a board meeting once a month, you know, inside the company for weeks and weeks and weeks, doing fundamental stuff, because it wasn't, there weren't a, a line of CEOs off the shelf that you would get in a digital business, um, say, in the West Coast. So I think there's a need to do it. It's a bit like the question about um, subordinate returns. Um, at the moment in our space, you have to be like that. Uh, and if you want to get good, good performance, um, you know, it's part of being in the space. Yeah. So, Bruno, you have the same thing for you? Are you helping? 
Yeah, I think it also depends a little bit on what stage the company is. If, if it is a startup, if it is a gross capital company, uh, the kind of support changes. Uh, I think the smaller the company, the more resources are needed, that's as simple as that, and everybody has to help and support. I think what investors can best do is leverage their network, get people involved that know specific tasks or have a specific network. Mm -hmm. In particular, if you deal with large utilities, as we have in an example, uh, it's, it's, it's very helpful if you have people that have been on boards of those utilities or even in, in, in the management board of those utilities who have the network and, think, and then can help to build up the contacts and the network. Yeah. So that is very important. Peter, if you've got yeah, good examples. I, I, I totally agree. Um, we we, we as, actually as agreed that we would every, disagree every, every now and then. I, I cannot disagree to, to <laughs> this. I mean, we, 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 of, of course, our uh, ideal portfolio companies is one that doesn't need any help, but just flies by itself <laughs> and, uh, and brings a fantastic return. But uh, a startup company is small, and it needs a lot of uh, additional expertise and insight in markets and, and technology. And we try to bring it from, um, from corporations in our funds that, um, that sometimes have uh, very useful um, uh, capabilities that, uh, that can be used. But it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it val value add is a lot. If you count also that sometimes we, um, uh, we appoint ourselves as a CEO, as least one of our partners gets into a company uh, interim to, to get it through a difficult uh, situation and move yeah. it to, to the next uh, funding round. It just takes all and will take all to make it happen. And this is one where I really want Tom's input as both uh, a serial entrepreneur and I think you're not calling yourself a VC but a company builder, right? So We are early stage investors and company builders. So because my partners and I, we are, we are serial entrepreneurs, we can't let it go. I mean, we, we cl make a clear dis distinction whether we see a spe specific deal as a passive investment, and then we try to behave and let go. And, and um, do you manage? Or? But then most of my time I spend in the, our active company building projects. And I'm 60 to 80 percent in one deal that uh, uh, still profits a little bit from my help and my partners. I mean, we bring in our network, our know-how. It's a small company, so everybody has to work hard until uh, it has a specific uh, size and can go on its own. So actually, many of you, if not even all of you, have experience uh, also in investing in non-clean tech companies versus clean tech companies. Do you think it's actually requiring a different skill, maybe first on the investor side, you know, does it require something different as an investor than in, you know, you're an investor in a music streaming company? <laughs> <laughs> Peter? Uh, I think on a, on a high level, the answer is no. Everything's, uh, I mean, uh, conceptually it's the same thing. I mean, you try to invest in, in a company that you understand, uh, very important. You understand the sector, you understand the, uh, the needs and, and, and the, the challenges that uh, such a company has to, has to go through. Um, so that is the same in all sectors, but you need to understand the sector in which you're investing uh, uh, very well. And, uh, and obviously, in, 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 in the early days of clean tech, we, un we thought we understood all sectors that, mm -hmm. um, that were involved in this, uh, in this ecosystem. But uh, it's impossible. It's just a couple of sectors that you can specialize. So back to your earlier point about sector specialization. specialization. Specialization is, uh, is very important. So I think also for the entrepreneurs, right? If you pick an investor, and if, if you have the choice, which is not always a given, yeah. you know, get someone with sector specialization. Yeah. Rob, would you agree that it's the yeah, same I, skill set? I, I mean, it's the same skills, but different experts. Sorry, we're so agreeing again. But I mean, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, the fundamentals of a good business are the same, you know, irrespective of whether you're selling SaaS or, um, you know, solar power uh, product. Um, what's different, though, is the knowledge of the sectors, and that knowledge is acquired through experience. It's, it's hard to pick it out of a book. Uh, so, so when we are recruiting to my team, we're looking for people who've been around for you know, at least a, a whole cycle. Uh, and when we, we, things come into us and we're looking off and stuff out of universities, it's, there's quite a lot of it's like one of these, right? There's a lot of analogy that we use based on experience. And occasionally we look at deals that we haven't got a lot of experience with, and you, you, you just sort of wear, you don't have that granular knowledge, you know, scar tissue, real practitioner stuff. So I think business is the same anywhere, but it, the, the understanding of these markets is also necessary. Yeah. 
The analogy I always use is that um, uh, it's, uh, being an investor uh, or being on the board of a company is a little bit like the guy in the old cinemas which is standing in the back of the room and changing the celluloid tapes and he, there was these white dots always appearing in the right corner of the movie and uh, when the guy had been watching the movie and changing them like five times, he didn't need the white dots anymore. He knew that when James Dean was kissing Marilyn Monroe, that's the time to switch on the light and I think that's a little bit uh, what you're saying, yeah. right? We're not only switching on the light. <laughs> <laughs> Off the light every now and then. <laughs> so there you go. And Bruno, I think when we were chatting about this, you, you, I think you had a point about, you know, uh, kind of like the two by two you were well, maybe I'll let you draw uh, the, the matrix, right? Well, maybe, maybe the first thing is uh, in this clean tech space, I, I don't call it sector because I don't see it as a sector, it's more a theme. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, we, what we see here is we have a lot of regulatory impact in this environment. And I think it's very important to understand what the regu regulatory impact can be. I don't think any of us can understand what the politi politicians are up to over the next five years, and that is the risk of this theme, the clean tech theme. I think that is a, a skill that you have to be very careful with from the past experience, if you look into solar market or wh whatever we have seen in the past. So the regulatory environment. The other thing is, the other aspect is also that we have, uh, because it's a theme, we have a lot of different skill sets that are required. We have consumer businesses, we have B2B businesses, we have hardware, we have software, we have almost project financing type of situations. So it's, uh, it's also important as an investor to concentrate a little bit the activities and know where your strength is. And does it extend to the entrepreneurs as well? Like to the, the management teams? Is, is there, Rob? You want to say? I think we, we end up having to um, not rely on having experienced entrepreneurs. That, that would say is a big difference. So I, I've done personally a few um, investments outside of clean tech, and in, in one case one was very successful, and it was a, a serial entrepreneur. And there you can be more passive. But you know, in clean tech, that you know, with well, tech fusion, there aren't many experienced fusion CEOs around. So <laughs> you've got to like find people who have the energy and talent, and then support them because you know they you know. So I think the, the talent piece is is different. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to come and get involved in clean tech companies because of the sort of save the world motivation. Yeah. And leveraging that to attract talent is great, but then they don't have a sense of how to optimize their business based on experience, right? It's all it's the first time each time. So each time you're doing a first of a kind almost uh, with more innovative companies. And that, that makes the talent picture different. You can't rely on, on entrepreneurial experience as much. Yeah. Tom? Um, uh, it's kind of funny. So if you are investing in a medical device company or a drug company, it's clear that one of the, the founders is an expert for regulatory affairs, or they hire somebody, a senior person with regula <laughs> regulatory affairs uh, experience. So many of the companies that we saw here today and yesterday have great technology innovations. And first thing I would ask them is, do you have a, somebody there for call it regulatory affairs or Energiewirtschaft in German, so energy economics. It's something you can study at a university and you know how the system works. Was that a deal, a big deal at Intelios, at your that company? That was a major deal. Uh, we were kind of naive going in. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually built a very large, successful technology platform. And what slowed us down, I mean, it did work and it did work out well in the end, but what slowed us down um, was uh, regulatory affairs. I mean, in, in the internet, uh, you can do whatever is not illegal. In the energy, it wasn't a regulatory. Yeah. Yeah. Think about the energy <laughs> world. <laughs> you, regulation will you, can, you can only do what's positively <clears throat> written down as legal in the books. Nothing else. So if you have a new idea, first make sure it's in the books. So you have to change laws first, and then you can do it. Uh, what we look for when we're investing is, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully it's not regulated what you're doing. So energy efficiency is a nice thing that we do. Um, rent scooters, why not? Um, uh, but whenever you meddle in the energy system on a day-to-day -day basis, trading, uh, demand response, and so on, careful, you need experts on board. Yeah. It can so be done, but careful. So that's maybe a good segue into government, and not on the regulatory side, but on the other side. I mean, obviously, and in particular on the more infrastructural and new technologies, Fusion is a good example, but there's other ones. Um, uh, should government and play a role? Or I, I guess the answer is yes. And how do you tap into it, right? So, you know, is it getting a Colin Powell or a Tony Blair on this, uh, on this thing? Uh, Rob, what do you think? Yeah. 
which I can before, I think Theresa May might be available in a few months' time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know just, just following up from the comments about regulatory affairs, uh, the markets we operate in, you know, food, energy, water, there's an expectation of voters that those are going to be provided, you know, relatively low cost. Um, and so it's an area of active public policy. Uh, and, and you know, actually, our experience, uh, mostly with the UK government, but also with people in the US, is uh, there's a real desire from policymakers, officials, and, and, and political leaders to understand what opportunities can arise from um, some of this disruptive technology. Uh, and you have to have a dialogue with them. So, so I was on a UK government green finance task force. Uh, all these things take time. Uh, but if you get it right, you, you can help governments uh, sort of make the right policy choices. Uh, and a good example in the UK of making the right policy choice was deciding to focus on a few low carbon sectors around infrastructure and in offshore wind, which has now become quite successful. And at the time they did that in around about 2009, offshore wind was still thought to be very expensive. It was quite a courageous move uh, for the UK government. And there are other examples, and fuel cells, say, in Japan. So, so you can have an impact. Um, it, it takes a lot of time and expertise and effort, and occasionally you have to hire an ex-politician. Uh, but it's, I think it's necessary in our space. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else got experience with uh, governments and getting you know, support, money from governments in a positive sense or conversely in a, in a negative sense that it slows you down? Because these guys work at a different pace, I guess, than most startup companies. <laughs> Bruno? Um, yeah. Um, the, oh, Tom? Tom? Yeah, go, uh, ahead. go ahead. I mean, I don't want to bitch about them, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, it is amazing how passive aggressive the lobbying was by the incumbents. Mm. Uh, I mean, whoever is running a coal-fired power plant is, of course, the enemy of the new demand response software person who saves all that infrastructure. And we never encountered active uh, opposition, but behind the doors, it was very clear that um, the process of, 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 of modernizing the regulation was slowed down. Mm. So one day, I remember, the new Energiewirtschaftsgesetz came out we, uh, there was a paragraph in there that made demand response possible. The day before it was published, overnight it disappeared. <laughs> so but, that just happens. Yeah. Um, so there's actually more lobbying power with the big so, incumbents yeah, within yeah. regulations. So align, so align with the big guys, so they have the lobbying yeah. power, and they are here in Berlin yeah. uh, day and night, so to speak. And how do you overcome that? Excuse me? How do you overcome that? How do you overcome that? Maybe by aligning with big corporates who are here, who so have maybe. that power. Because, I mean, if, you, if you're that startup and in your budget you have a line item for lobbying and regulatory affairs, you're thrown out. I mean, no VC wants to see that. Yeah. So that's maybe, the, what, uh, and only briefly, because there was a whole uh, panel yesterday on corporate venturing, but one question which I didn't think was, was uh, asked yesterday so yeah. much is most su successful companies that become really successful did one major deal with someone big. Is that the same in this space? And do you have good examples of that, Peter, maybe? If I, I think it's a, it's a very important point that uh, in the end it's about, it's about really scaling up to, 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 to big markets and, and it's very hard to do that as a, as a startup by yourself. So you have to build these partnerships, you have to build them early. It's actually something that, um, that we promote a lot in our portfolio. We connect um, the, the companies we invest in with the corporates that are investing in our fund. Um, these are not corporates that would necessarily, uh, in the end, buy such a company, but they can, mm -hmm. they can be a customer, they can be a supplier, they can do anything to, to scale the company from a couple million to, to 50 million revenue, and, and then you can exit the company. Yeah. Specific examples on really big deals, Bruno, Rob? So um, Series Power last year, we had Wei Chai Power, the Chinese sort of bus and engine manufacturer, come in, and then a few months later, Bosch. Uh, and both those companies came into the equity, but also with a very clear strategic rationale. And that completely changed the way PPP people perceive the company. Um, and you know, now there are the plans for infrastructure, factories, and all this stuff. And it, you, you want the, the corporates to be providing that infrastructure with a lower cost of capital. And the other thing is, you know, it, you have a company doing pilot manufacturing, you go and talk to a Bosch, it's a skill set thing. You know, core competence of startups is not you know, high value manufacturing, quality systems, supply chain. So they, they bring all these other skills as well as the capital and distribution channels. Yeah. So I'd like to actually close on, um, uh, I've seen a couple of people walking around. Uh, Tom has a, uh, 
the, the strategic development goals, the 17 strategic development goals of the United Nations, and I managed to nick one of an entrepreneur that wanted to have something from me, and I got this one in return, so I'm wearing one as well. The, um, uh, maybe a bit of the little story to start with it is I, a long time ago, I think 15 years ago, I was in the office of Bill Joy, one of the partners at Kleiner Perkins, founder of uh, Sun Microsystems, and he actually is a very close friend to uh, Bill Gates, and he was, at the time, he was developing a framework which he called the 10 Grand Challenge challenges, and some of them were very similar, um, some of them were societal, but a number of them were um, in fact related to the kind of stuff that we're doing here, and the four that I, you know, in the back of my mind always were there was like sustainable CO2-free energy, obviously, that created in the end, I think, breakthrough energy ventures to a large extent, sustainable food production, water, plastic in the ocean. So um, if we think about these grand challenges, and I would ask you guys uh, each to pick one thing, one area where you think in the next two to three year, which is solving a big problem, where you think you should be able to make a good investment in, what one would you pick and why? Yeah. Maybe, maybe just oh, put on your, yeah. There, there's, there's, one, um, there's one recent report to the Club of Rome by the Stockholm Resilience Center, and they uh, actually, um, um, their, their report says that, that we don't, we, we cannot just focus on addressing the 17 sustainable development goals, but we have to make sure that the planet survives that because some of these goals are contradicting each other. If we uh, make sure that to, um, to get rid of poverty by just conventional economic growth, we kill the planet. So we have to address these sustainable development goals within the planetary boundaries. And the planetary boundaries are, yeah, keep, uh, keep the air clean, the land okay, and, and biodiversity okay, and so on. So which um, area am so I? Th they say it's uh, oh, number you. one priority is renewable energy, okay. and, and we are aligned with that. Uh, faster, uh, bring more and faster re uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. Number two is actually uh, increased I want one. I want productivity one. Gonna, food. <laughs> I want one from each of you, so okay, renewable energy, so, faster. We are in energy okay. efficiency, yeah. Bruno? Uh, yes, in the next two, two three years, I, I think there is a great opportunity in the German market, in Europe, and that is smart grids, because there are about 12 million smart meters being rolled out as we speak, and they, they if you install them right, they configure a center of communication for every building. And you can build applications on that. Good. So I would say over the next two, three years, this is, this is a nice task. Good one. And concise, Rob? I have one word for you, Bart, which is electrochemistry. Uh, and the reason is we've got all these cheap electrons coming through from renewables uh, from all over the world. But we have problems like steel making, shipping, long distance road freight, aviation. Uh, so a fundamental new industry of the 21st century is the ability to take cheap electrons and turn them into valuable molecules, be they hydrogen, ammonia for shipping, hydrocarbons for aviation. So, so this, this is a bit of a... chemistry. Electro, it is a bit like the graduate, right? Yeah, Plastics. exactly. It is, I was thinking Plastics. of that example. One word for you, son, electrochemistry. Electrochemistry. <laughs> Peter, what is your, what is your uh, word? Uh, there's no word. I'm afraid of a bit, a bit more complicated story. <laughs> if okay. you allow me for a few more moments. Um, we no are good. VC investors. We have uh, we have also limited amount of uh, of capital, so we have to be very smart in where we invest. And with with 1,500 million, you cannot uh, transform an old industry. So what we do and what we continue to do is is, is look at, at at hotspots within the sectors, analyze them through, and 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 pick one of the companies that is best positioned okay. to make an impact there. But once again, with with 50 or 100 million, you can make only a very small impact in this huge challenge that we have to work on for the next hundreds okay. of years. Okay, so I'm going to take the prerogative of um, being the moderator and therefore having the closing answer to my own question. And if for me, it's pretty clear. If we want to solve the energy problem, we could do it in very small steps or we do it in one big step. So the word is actually fusion energy. No surprise. Thank you guys very much. Jan? I think this was then the first half hour of the panel, and as the weather is not so great, we're going to move into the second half of an hour. <laughs> <laughs> just, just so, okay. All right. All right. Yes.